We start with a narrated expo dump followed by a written expo dump, which is a bigger red flag for disappointment than cheapening out and having no custom title sequence for your opening epi. Suddenly, a giant fuck off dragon appears, soaring over the city and conveniently giving us a geographical introduction to the layout of the show's locations. The dragon lands and the medieval equivalent of air traffic controllers try to calm the beast down. Then a small blonde girl who looks unnervingly like Will Porter in a wig dismounts the prickly beast and goes to see her sickly mum, who seems to be infected with something called pregnancy. Here we learn that her name is Rhaenyra, and she says to stop worrying about me and instead focus on cooking up that air what the king really wants. Her mum Ayema reckons that her discomfort is just how women serve the realm, and all I've heard that before. My wife also sat on her ass all day when she was knocked up and said she was too busy serving the realm to do all the dishes, or something like that. Her mum tries to remind her that one day she'll have to sit on her ass all day cooking up an air for her hubby, but stunning and brave Rhaenyra, who don't need no man, says sod all that. She wants to be one of the lads and go out riding dragons all day. It's here that Ayama tells her daughter that the childbed is our battlefield, and you can practically hear a thousand armchair critics groan as they get slapped over the head with foreshadowing and now know this lazy lass ain't got a cat's chance in hell of making it out of the epi alive. Then we're introduced to King Viserys and his council, talking about a pirate infestation in the Stepstones. And fuck me if that ain't an awesome name for a band. And how they will defeat this mini-boss called Craghass Dreha, who's going around torturing people with crabs. And as a certified top shagger back in my uni days, I for one know just how torturous crabs can be. Anyway, Will Porter in a wig joins the meeting where the super important role of the king's daughter is unironically to stand around and bear cups. Asking her why she's late, she tells him she went to visit her pawny mum, whilst he gives her a sniff and can totally tell she's been out mounting giant spiky lizards all day. Not a joke. The king is really excited for the birth of his new son, although his official hand reminds him that there's some tournament event happening later in the episode, in celebration of the new heir what the king is totally somehow convinced is a boy in his wife's belly because reasons. Then we're introduced to Matt Smith in a wig, talking in some native tongue to Will Porter in a wig, and he sits on the throne thing saying he's come back for his tournament. Apparently, his name is unironically Damon, and ignoring how laughably on the nose that is, his niece reminds him that the tournament is actually for the king's heir. And here we get more foreshadowing by having this Damon fella sit slightly forward on the throne in a menacing light while surrounded by a hundred pointy things, as he reckons that's totally him. Anyway, Will Porter in a wig sits under a tree with her head in her mate's crotch, talking about how she just wants to get on her dragons, fly off to see the world and eat cake all day. AKA do a fucking gap yard. Her pretty friend, who's called Alison, practically tells her to stop being a clown and making jest about duty and stuff. Rhaenyra then channels the waistline energy of Piers Morgan when she says, I never jest about cake. Then we cut back to the king having samples taken of his scabby back, and we learn that the wound isn't healing as it should and he's likely dying. Hence why he's so desperate for someone to take up his massive fuck off chair. He goes to see his wife, who once again is lazing around because pregnancy, and he calls her out by saying she spends more time in that fucking bath than he does on the throne. Funny, because that's exactly what I said last night when I looked over to my wife soaking in suds whilst I was two feet away taking a dump. <clears throat> anyway, she tells him that this is the last time she's going to try and cook him up in air, as she's already tried it six times before and somehow keeps messing it up, even though she literally has one fucking job. Over in the town, we're shown that Prince Daemon is commander of the City Watch, which is just a fancy name for police commissioner and chief thug. Turns out he and his bunch of henchmen all have sweet shiny new threads, and he then riles up his coppers by declaring that tonight every criminal of King's Landing will learn to fear the colour gold, which sounds like he's going into battle against a fucking Green Lantern or something. Suddenly, his thugs all rush out into the city and smack up a bunch of people, while slaughtering some randos in a crowd by just pointing at some poor sods and accusing them of being murderers and stuff, before one shouts rapist and promptly gets his chappy cut off, which turns out to be the girthiest piece of gristle I've seen since I was Amy Schumer's personal masseuse. Anyway, Matt Smith in a wig turns out to be a right wind-up merchant, and goes around trolling everyone in the room until the king's hand Otto gets triggered by the blonde bastard mocking his recently dead wife, King Viserys then warns his little bro to stop dicking about and tells him he mustn't keep going around the town chopping off cocks willy-nilly. <laughs> Lol. We then cut to Daemon shagging a common whore bareback and raw before the tournament begins the next morning. At said tournament, a 
A random knight asked for the favour of Princess Rayanist Targoyen, before reminding her she was the princess who never was, because patriarchy. Later, we are introduced to Sir Criston Cole, a common-born lad, but who's just impressively unhorsed two Baratheon lads, as Will Porter in a wig makes with the lusty eyes whilst trying to keep the fanny flutters at bay. Suddenly, though, the king bursts into his master bedroom, where his wife is still lazing about on her back, but apparently this time there's a good reason for it. She's only about to go and give birth. So, after whinging and whining and wriggling about for a bit like a right drama queen, the doctor bloke tells King Viserys that she's failed again at doing her one job, and now he will have to either lose both his queen and babe, or sacrifice the woman what can't even give birth to his heir. Back at the tournament, Damon has arrived and faces off with Sir Criston whilst giving Will Porter a raging lob on. Bruh. Then Queen Aemma wakes up in a blissful haze doped up on delirious exhaustion, before her husband orders his doctors to slice her open like a common hog to extract his hair. Shots are then interspliced between Damon prematurely celebrating a victory whilst the doctors play a quick game of Operation IRL. Unfortunately though, they touch the sides a fair few times, which makes Queen Aemma's nose light up red and also die. Sir Criston then makes a bigger comeback than Brian Stelter's undigested lunch and makes Prince Damon look like a right cack. Back at the castle, it turns out the king was right all along, and it was a boy growing in the stomach of that woman he was supposed to love but totally just killed because his other kid has the wrong genitalia. But then we instantly cut to some cliff where it's revealed the baby died pretty much straight away somehow, and thus all that wife mutilating was in vain, and they also ruined perfectly good bedsheets for no reason. Princess Rhaenyra then goes all emo and moans about not being good enough because of a lack of a cock. Though I'm not sure why that's a problem. Surely in this day and age you can just identify as someone with a cock? And Twitter keeps telling me there are totally things like girl dicks now anyway. Also, I think she's a bit bitter because her dad totally let her mother die in the literal childbed whilst battling to birth his heir, so it's pretty understandable why she busts out her resting bitch face right about now. Bruh. Anyway, the council then meet to discuss their options, and the king lashes out at them all for suggesting the heir has to be Damon. Even though every time the king gives the blonde bugger a position, Otto says he'd be too reckless in the role. Having no other recourse, Otto brings up putting the king's firstborn child on the chair. Naturally, all these gamity blokes scoff at the idea of a fanny on the throne because patriarchy, and they all argue amongst themselves until King Viserys also goes all emo and has a bigger emotional outburst than a Twitch streamer when the Wi-Fi goes down. Otto then meets up with his daughter Alison and steers her into going to confront the king, i.e. totally grooming her into manoeuvring into crucial political positions like a medieval version of a World Economic Forum stooge. She then does exactly that, and finds the kingdom's most powerful man in his study, painting some models which disappointingly are not anything to do with Warhammer figurines. She connects with him by telling him how she felt when her own mother died, and is the only person shown on screen to even offer up some genuine condolences for the king who just lost his wife and seventh child in one day. Damon then addresses an orgy and calls the recently deceased infant an heir for the day. This enrages the king when Otto totally grasses Damon up, and confronts his older brother whilst he asserts his authority by sitting on his throne and shouting hurty words in a loud voice. The king says he's the only one what defends him in the court, yet he treats him like shit, whilst Damon says all the king ever does is send him away. And before the classic Duff Duffs of the East Enders End theme tune starts playing, King Viserys unironically sends him away again, this time to the runestone along with his wife, before sitting back in his chair and randomly cutting his pinky on a blade of the throne. Even more blatant foreshadowing aside, this bloody thing must be a health and safety nightmare. I mean, just think of the paperwork for this bleeding monstrosity. The king then goes all emo yet again and lights a bunch of candles in a dark room to do a bit of soul searching, and realises the air he really deserved was under his nose the whole time. So the council all pledge fealty to the fanny what none of them wanted anywhere near the throne because patriarchy. The king then warns his daughter of a time when the kingdom of men will fall, but uses euphemisms to convey that with a wink wink to the audience. Something about a particularly cold season approaching, or something like that. But when that time comes, all the kingdom must be united to stand against it with a Targaryen seated on the Iron Throne. Then they drop the series title A Song of Ice and Fire into the dialogue, and you can just hear dollar signs flashing in the eyes of that double R Martin fella, just like when Simon Cowell sees fresh meat in a pop idol audition. Then we linger on the image of Princess Rhaenyra of Dragonstone being formally named heir to the Iron Throne by the king. And we end on a shot of her anxious yet determined face as she finally defeats patriarchy when a bunch of blokes totally promise she can sit on a chair sometime in the future. And that's it. That's episode one. Personally, I thought that was a good start, but admittedly the pace was a little slow. So I hope this show doesn't totally... 
drag on. <laughs> oh, shut up. That's what you're here for. Now onward to episode two. After a 1 minute and 40 second opening title sequence, but just lazily recycling the same old music as the OG series, we open on a bunch of bodies being munched on by crabs, as the dastardly Dreher takes over the stepstones. We cut to the king and the council discussing who will replace the Lord Commander of the King's Guard after the last one has just died off screen. But before we can spend any more time listening to this utterly riveting dribble, a black dude who's watched Matrix Reloaded too many times suddenly bursts through the door. Apparently his name's Lord Corliss, and he wants to know what King Viserys is going to do about this Stepstones business, because he's lost four ships and the whole beach is burning up faster than Hillary Clinton's private server. Otto tries to buy him off, but this race swap Matrix dude says he don't want no stinking compo, instead he wants to go straight over there and tear some shit up. The King however is not prepared to start a war with the Free Cities, so the convo then turns toward Damon being allowed to build his own private army right on their own fucking doorstep. It's here that some crucial exposition is casually dropped into the dialogue, when it's mentioned that Matt Smith has been squatting in Dragonstone Castle for over half a year. That's when Princess Will Porter in a wig suggests sending a fuckton of dragon riders to settle the whole Stepstone stuff, and thereby undermines her father and king by coming up with a clear and basic plan. So the king tells her to sod off and stop making him look a right melt in front of his buddies, and tells the saint of killers from Preacher to take her down to choose a new king's guard after the earlier one died off screen as mentioned earlier. Rhaenyra then spends 10 minutes dismissing a bunch of candidates for the said Kingsguard role before picking the one she fancies most and ignoring all the potential political advantages offered by any of the others. The king then opens up to Alicent about how Rhaenyra barely talks to him anymore, despite him naming her as his heir last week and promising her a giant fuck off throne in a few years. She advises he talk to her, but he implies he's too much of a pussy old to talk to teenage girls about emotions and stuff, and then disturbingly requests that their private talks remain their little secret. Also, Rhaenyra is confirmed to be 15 in this scene, which is strange because she looks more like 25 and also like Will Porter in a wig. But I think I've already mentioned that. King Viserys then does a bit of politicking out in the gardens, greeting Princess Rhaenys, aka the Queen Who Never Was, as his favourite cousin, and thus giving the audience crucial context as to the relationship situation of these characters who all seem to have confusingly similar names. Anyway, the black dude who's watched too many Matrix sequels apologises to King Viserys for his temper earlier and for smashing through his doors as he entered. Apparently, the crown is seen as vulnerable in the kingdom because there is still no proper heir. And by proper, they mean male. So they propose uniting their houses to strengthen the kingdom and having this 50 year old white dude marry their mixed race daughter Lena. The king scoffs and we think it's because he's a giant racialist, but it turns out it's because she's a preteen child with a hairless muff. A bit later, the king is sitting by the fire talking to the small council as the doctor shoves his hand into a bunch of maggots to eat the dead flesh off that scratch he suffered at the end of episode 1. Why he can't just use a plaster like a normal person, I don't know. Anyway, he doesn't know if marrying a preteen is the right move and although some are for and against it in the council, he decides to sleep on it. The next morning he takes a stroll with his proposed prepubescent potential lady wife where she recites clearly scripted dialogue in a badly acted and robotic way. Turns out her parents have told her exactly what to say, and she's not, as I suspected, just an extra who's wandered over from Amazon's Lord of the Rings TV show shooting nearby. Just above, Princess Rainies and Princess Rhaenyra have a passive-aggressive Barney about whether this Will Porter fella is feeling humiliated after potentially about to have a stepmom with less pubes than her. Rhaenys says that although it does make her uncomfortable pushing her virginal kid onto a scabby old king, she understands the way of things, which is essentially patriarchy. And that it's inevitable that female Will Porter is going to be chucked on the scrap heap once her dad shags that toddler and produces a proper heir. Because men would sooner put the realm to the torch than see a woman ascend the Iron Throne. Continuing with her dad's political scheme, Alicent Hightower continues to bond with the most powerful man in the kingdom and gives him a figurine of a dragon and make him with the puppy dog eyes like a reverse groomer. Suddenly though, Otto bursts in and it's revealed that some crafty bastard has stolen a prized dragon egg from under the nose of 50 dragon keepers and all I can think is we're about to go on a massive adventure quest Spyro 3 style to retrieve it. But alas, Prince Damon sends over a wedding invitation and immediately admits that it was him what done the nicking, boasting that because he's a real heir of the throne he's also now taken a second wife and took the egg because his new woman is now pregnant and wants the egg to put in the babe's cradle as per tradition. Or something like that. Turns out he's taking the egg of a dragon called Dreamfire, 
which sounds totally badass and is the same egg that they chose for the cradle of the recently deceased baby from episode one, clearly designed to provoke the king into confronting him at Dragonstone. Well, the king is well and truly provoked, and is about to storm down there to smack a bitch up until Otto gives him a get out of a disastrous and potentially humiliating situation free card and offers to go down there on his behalf. Once there, turns out Prince Damon says he's just following the traditions of his house, though Otto reckons it's straight up sedition to set up what is effectively a shadow monarchy, complete with a self-styled king, a queen and a personal military army, all on the king's actual doorstep. Naturally, Otto does his best to simmer tensions and avoid conflict by slinging every insult he can think of towards the king's hot-headed and actual brother, and after minutes of measuring dicks on a giant wall, they eventually all draw swords, until a giant fuck-off dragon appears and Otto and his men all look royally stuffed. Well, that is until a literal stunning and brave Princess Rhaenyra arrives on the back of her own dragon. But as the character is only 15, she legally can't do her own stunts. So the VFX team stick her in front of a clear and obvious green screen and say, ah, oh, that'll do, boys. Let's go to the pub. Anyway, Will Porter in a wig totally stands up to Matt Smith in a wig, and because he clearly fancies his own niece, decides to concede and walk off like a right cuck. The princess and the king's guard take the egg back to the castle, whilst Prince Damon gets a bollocking from his common whore fakey wife bird for randomly announcing they were going to be wed without even asking her first. She then bemoans that a man who is literally called Damon may not be being entirely truthful in their relationship. She's worried now because although the king won't dare put his own brother's head on a pike, her nitty noggin is fair game given she's just a common whore with a funny accent what no one can really understand without HBO subtitles. King Viserys decides he ain't going to marry a literal child after all, and then bollocks his daughter for going out and undermining his own hand by doing what he couldn't and retrieving the egg without bloodshed. They then have what she thinks is an honest heart to heart, but the next day he suddenly reveals that he's decided to marry her best friend Alison Hightower without even giving her the courtesy of a heads up. Hilariously, the only person in the room who is happy about this is Otto Hightower, whose cockamimi scheming has moved him closer to power now his own sprog is totally going to be porking the king. Will Porter, though, is shocked and humiliated once again now her teenage best friend is about to become her stepmom. Especially after her dad didn't give her any warning, nor a chance to talk him out of stitching her up like a kipper. The white dreadlock Matrix superfan is equally outraged, as he wanted to flog his own preteen kid with a hairless muff to the king. And even Alison herself seems flabbergasted that she's now going to have to spend the next 30 odd years having her flabbergasted by a fat old scabby bloke what sticks his hands into maggots. And we end on a scene where Matt Smith and this Lord Corliss fella seem to bury the hatchet and agree to a trucy team up. As they both want to get suited up and go full charge into the stepstones to defeat the half naked stinky guy who's riddled with crabs. And that's it. That's episode two. Man, there's more scheming going on here than the American Congress. But anyway, on to episode three. After a one minute and 40 second opening title sequence, we open with a man being tied to a post, as crabs pinch off his skin piece by piece. The poor sod sees Prince Damon's dragon in the skies and foolishly thinks he's come to rescue him, before the dragon steps on his chest and squashes him flatter than Prince Elrond's face. Damon clearly ain't got time for that, and tries to find the dastardly crab feeder leader, Kragus Drehar, but his crabby minions scare him away with pointy arrows. Then it turns out we've suffered a two year time jump because reasons. Now the king has a new babe called Prince Egan, or Prince Egg for short. Anyway, this eggy prince also looks like he's going to have an eggy bro or sis, as the only king seems to have knocked up his teenage wife yet again. Anyway, the council keep bothering the king about that stepstones business at his own son's party, when he just wants to sit down and eat some meat. Apparently the triarchy are sheltering in caves, cowering from the giant fuck off dragon what keeps appearing and toasting their asses. but the Valerian forces have suffered heavy attrition and Damon has driven the men hard and are now questioning his command. Most likely on account of sending his men on suicide missions then having his dragon step on their chest when they think they're about to be saved. That doesn't really do much for morale. Otto however reckons it's all gone on for so long that the crown stepping in now would make them look like America coming into World War II at the last minute and claiming all the glory. I'm paraphrasing, of course. Then we cut to the gardens where a medieval Ed Sheeran is warbling on his little lute whilst Princess Rhaenyra makes him play that banging tune all over again. And even he implies he's getting sick of being the old equivalent of a replay button but IRL. It's just like when I play the catch-up song by Last Ketchup on Spotify over and over and over all fucking day, leading to my wife going nuts and divorcing me over my catch-up-y obsession. <laughs> anyway... 
Her ex-best friend now turned stepmom and literal queen, Alison Hightower, asked her to join them at the buffet because they bought a shit ton of grub from Waitrose and don't want it to go to waste. Apparently, there's still major beef between these two broads and Rhaenyra appears to still have not got over the whole marrying me dad situation even though two years have apparently passed. I'm almost expecting these two to go full Slater sisters from EastEnders with Rhaenyra shouting You can't tell me what to do! You ain't my mother! And Alison shouts back Yes, I am! Because I married your dad, remember? <laughs> anyway, the Targaryen family travel to the ceremonial hunt that's happening in honour of the Eggy Prince's second name day. Why these fuckers can't just say birthday, I don't know. Where on the way, Will Porter in a wig sulks in the back of the carriage and moans that no one's there for her, even though all her family are right there next to her. When they arrive, there's dozens of giant fancy tents, which makes it all look like a budget Glastonbury, just without the skanks hanging out of porter potties and spaced out teens throwing up in their bucket hats. In the main tent, the king catches a handsome guy sizing up his daughter, and instead of smacking him upside the head, he instead makes a mental note and hatches a plan. Rhaenyra is looking a bit lost, and sits down with a bunch of ladies chatting shit in a circle. They make a few digs at the princess whilst Alison defends her, until Rhaenyra snaps back at an old hag holding a pug and reckons she's the one what ate all the pies. Well cake, but you get the drift. Then some cripple comes in and cramps their style, so she goes outside where she meets the handsome guy from earlier who was looking her up and down. His name is Lord Jason Lannister and she hits it off with this beardy geezer what looks like a budget Thor, but turns out it was all to set up by her dad to raise the standing of a Lord of Castle Rock because he's obsessed with marrying her off. She storms into the main tent and confronts her dad like a right drama queen, whilst he says she's 17 now so she'll be five kids deep in a council house in Peckham and not hanging about his castle like a bad smell. Now she's adamant that she don't want a bloke to put a ring on it, but he goes mental and yells about even the king not existing above traditional duty. Otto intervenes to simmer tempers by saying they've sighted a hog out in the woods, though turns out it was a false alarm and was just one of the old maids in the crapper. Hey, maybe it is like Glastonbury after all. Anyway, Will Porter in a wig rides out to the lake with Sir Christian Stewart to get some fresh air, whilst they make eyes at each other and totally foreshadow some saucy shenanigans that are going to take place at some point in the future. Back at the hunt, the king gets an update as to the last sighted whereabouts of the wild heart they are hunting, and Otto explains that her droppings were found half a league to the east. They can tell that because they proceed to both hold and sniff the random turd they found in the middle of a wood. I swear this is how things like monkeypox happen. Later that evening, the king is just chilling on his travel throne as Jason Lannister proceeds to try and offer a few non-existent dragons for the hand of his princess daughter, but somehow ends up talking himself into being done for treason and almost gets arrested by his once potential dad-in-law. <laughs> Don't you just date it when that happens? Anyway... Just when you thought that mucky incesty stuff from the OG GOT was gone, the creepy Otto fella suggests marrying his daughter off to her own half-brother. Yes, the two-year-old eggy prince who can't even wipe his own ass. <laughs> Talk about a downgrade. King Viserys then snaps at Otto and yells, I came here to hunt. Not to be suffocated by all this fucking politicking. Which is the old-timey equivalent of what a lot of us say when we go to the cinema these days. Wanting to watch the new Ghostbusters and Terminator films, only to be met with preachy lectures and girl boss gender cringe shit. Listen, I'm a simple man. Just let me scoff popcorn and watch badass chicks shoot a bunch of ghosts and robots for fuck's sake. But I digress. Then we get some more scenes of Sir Kristen Stewart flirting with Will Porter in a wig, before getting randomly gored by the world's worst CGI creature since that infamous deer in The Walking Dead, and another deer later in this episode. Then the king goes all emo and waxes poetically in front of a giant fuck off fire and tells Alison that although many in his lineage may have been dragon riders, none of them have ever been dreamers. Anyway, cut a long story short, he totally has an epi about being so obsessed with having a male heir because he saw it in a prophetic dream as a kid that it ended up killing Rhaenyra's mother. Which is weird because I thought it was the whole gutting her like a pig was what finished her off but hey ho. The next morning the king takes all his anger out on the pound shop deer they've caught which isn't the white heart they were after, but it'll fucking do, thinks the king. Mercifully, this thing is promptly dispatched with haste before the piss poor CGI gave any of the overworked VFX team a raging headache. Seriously, why is it so fucking hard to animate deers on these shows? 
Then Rhaenyra and Sir Criston stumble on the White Heart, which may be a symbol for something, but luckily I'm not a critic, so I don't actually have to do all that thinking and shit. I just call out what I see. And right now I see another dodgy deer what the VFX team can't animate for shit. Back at the castle, Otto is back scheming with his daughter, who feels all conflicted about raising that heir that will automatically depose her best friendly stepdaughter kid. Her dad tells her she's being a right melt and that his grandson will be heir and that's just how things are. Later, Alison and Viserys are chilling in their lounge when Ali spots a letter. Turns out Lord Corliss and Damon are badly losing their war and the former is begging for help but the king can't really do anything because they essentially made their own bed so they've got a lie in it, even if it's full of crabs and bones of their own soldiers. Eventually, Princess Will Porter in a wig and her dad Viserys finally lay all the metaphorical beef out on the table. She feels she's being replaced by the Eggy Prince fellow who can't yet figure out which of the three holes the circle shape goes in, whilst all the lords of the realm are lining up as vultures to feast on her bones and, most importantly, trying to get a piece of dat ass. Whilst her dad says he felt like her at her age, but understands tradition and duty, and didn't go to Lena Valerian to marry for love, yet instead chose to marry for strength like they should. Anyway, then he tells her to go line up her succession and multiply. And while she wouldn't know it by his face, it's gotta be awkward telling your teenage daughter to go shag around as much as she can. Anyway. Some poor sap of a knight gets asked to hand deliver a note to the madcap Matt Smith and his Matrix buddy about how the king will be sending assistance in their fight against the crab feeders. Or something like that. And since the show went out of its way to give this guy a name in this scene, it doesn't really bode well for his lifespan. Oh, and sure enough, after hand delivering the note to Prince Damon, Sir Adam gets pulverised into a mucky pulp as Matt Smith literally beats the messenger. Then he rows over to take on the crabby goons on his Jack Jones, and pretends to wave the white flag until psyching them into oblivion as a bunch of archers let loose a hundred arrows at him. Luckily though, he has plot armour up the kazoo, which doesn't even matter at this point given they all seem to have the aim of a stormtrooper with a bitch of a hangover, so the vast majority miss him until the plot calls for him to get wounded and it looks like it's curtains for the Matt Smith wannabe. But luckily a Douay Machina saves his ass just in the nick of time, where his allies led by the black guy who loves the Wachowskis arrive to finally tear shit up. And then Damon spots his arch nemesis Drehar the Crabfeeder go into a cave where he satisfyingly kills him off screen during a fucking montage. And that's it. That's the plot and that's your lot. Consider ringing that bell thing so you don't miss episodes 4 to 6 when they drop. Say hello in the comments if you have time and I'll see you in the next one.